couple of sessions on Milford Shingle Bank recorded in mid-August and mid-October. This is my go-to venue for black bream, but there are plenty of other fish to be caught as well. The shingle bank is part of her spit, but if you're not sure where that is or what rigs to use, then do check out my previous video. There are a number of marks worth fishing, as indicated on the map. However, in this video, I'm fishing two spots on the main bank before the dogleg bend. Parking is along New Lane and Saltgrass Lane, but you've got to get there early as it does get quite busy, particularly in the summer months. After crossing the footbridge and navigating past the kids crabbing, I walk along the top of Shingle heading towards the castle and count the wooden posts on my left. These act as markers for where you're fishing. My first session here is between post 3 and 4 and the second between 7 and 8. My first session's in very bright conditions with crystal clear water and hardly any wind. I'm using my standard 3 hook clip down bream rigs. These have got size 6 and size 8 hooks, loaded with small bits of ragworm and generally tipped with squid. There's a detailed tutorial on how to make these in my previous video. I've placed a link to that in the top right hand corner and in the description below this video. On this stretch I only fish neat tides and tend to fish it down. I've arrived at the top of the tide and it's still pulling from left to right but not very strong. If I got here any earlier I'd probably only be fishing one rod until the tidal pull slackens but since there's not much pull today and it's not windy I can fish with two rods straight away and I'm not even using a bag of stones to hold my tripod down which I'd normally do. However I still force the butt end of my rod into the shingle just to be on the safe side. I don't want my rods being pulled in by great big lumps of weed. I've already seen the angler to my left pull in a fair amount of weed so that's still a possibility. You can catch bream at any state of a tide here, but I tend to find that the main killing period is when a tide starts to slacken off after it's changed direction and is flowing from left to right. One of my rigs has been dislodged, so it's time to wind in and recast. I pull into a fair amount of weed, and this is only to be expected. You can spend a couple of hours over high water pulling in weed after weed, but you can also catch it this time so you just have to fish through it. Using 30 pound braid rather than 20 and 40 pound leader line minimises chances of breakages. However when fishing two rods quite often both rigs might get dislodged by weed and this is when tangles can happen. You then still end up having to cut line and retide leaders so sometimes it's better only to fish one rod when the tide is pulling. I've got away with it this time, but unfortunately I did think there was a fish on, but it's nowhere to be seen. You can waste an awful lot of time pulling weed off your rigs, but that's just an occupational hazard for fishing the Solent. The guy to my right is not having a weed problem, but he's only fishing the float. I did think about setting one up, since the conditions are ideal for that today. However, my best chances of catching bream are at distance, so I've opted not to do that. <laughs> 
never got round to it, but I have toyed with the idea of just fishing 50 pound braid straight through without a leader. Sometimes the bulk of a weed is actually at your leader knot and not at the rig. When you're pulling this in, quite often your rig is being dragged along the bottom. If you have hooked a fish, sometimes it works to its advantage and it can snag you on the way in, or just shed the hook. Fortunately, that hasn't happened this time and I see there's a fish on. However, I still want to take some of the weed off that leader knot before I drag the fish in, so the fish is left in the water until I can do this. Don't get me wrong, I'm not purposefully dragging the fish, I'm dragging the weed that's at the top of my rig. So, there we have it, the first bream of the day. Not the easiest way of getting them in, but that's normally what you're expecting until at least a couple of hours into the ebb. Didn't take long for the next bite, and this feels a bit better. Well, it fought a lot better. That's because it's failed hooked in a gill cover. The tide's now ebbing properly and the bites have increased. <laughs> 
an ebbing tide, a sun low in the sky, and little or no wind. Although it hasn't been prolific, these are now the perfect conditions for black bream. I see some surface activity to set up a third rod with feathers. I could have tried for mackerel at the top of the tide, but they also come at dusk. I had a quick go with the feathers, but that only proved to be a distraction from my main quarry. Lovely looking fish and tasty too, but today I've put all of them back. It helps to use small strips of squid, but you can just catch the bream on ragram alone. But if you just use squid by itself, I find you're waiting much longer for the bites. So for me, I generally use a combination of both. Sometimes I'll leave a bottom hook with just ragworm and occasionally the top hook with just bits of squid, particularly a couple of small tentacles. first double shot which is a bit unusual because normally these are quite common and triple shots <laughs> 
Just as I'm tempted to have another go for feathers, I see a little rattle on my left hand rod. That rattle produced a tiny pouting. Another quick go over feathers, but that didn't produce anything, so time to pack away that rod. No mackerel, but I was still getting bites on my bream rigs, so I decided to give it an hour or so into darkness. I ended up with a couple more bream, but I wasn't really set up for filming in the dark. Nevertheless, a really good session. 13 bream and that solitary pouting. As much as I would have liked to, I couldn't really find a time to fit in a session during September, so my next trip wasn't until mid-October. I was wondering whether I left it a bit late for the bream now. Weather conditions were good though, so I thought I still had a chance. Same rigs as before, however if a bream don't show, I am prepared to change. The guy who fished the float to my right last time actually ended up with two garfish. So this time, as well as my bream baits of, of a decent ragworm, squid, some fish already chopped up, I've also brought some sand eels just in case I have to fish for either undulates or those garfish. It's quite a stiff wind this time, but fortunately it's off my back. However, apologies for any wind noise. <laughs> 
I've only got one rod out to begin with, but it's a slow start, so I put the second one out. Despite the sun being out, it's not warm since that wind is from the northeast. With no bites forthcoming, it's time to get a little bit more active and set up a float rod. I'm trying out my Arcadia for this, which is a 4.4 metre beach ledger rod. It's very light, so it's comfortable as a float rod, but I'm having to use the stiffest tip for this. I now use a Fox FX9 carp reel with this rod and it's got 14 pound line. My float's already been matched with right size drill bullet and I've tied a size 6 B983 to 14 pound fluorocarbon. This is a bit heavier than what I'd normally use off a man made structure like a pier or some fire hoe. Unlike a man made structure where I'd generally just be casting close in, here I might have to cast at some distance. Elsewhere, I tend to use 8 or 10 pound fluorocarbon and hooks between about size 12 and size 6. Here, I've stepped up a bit since I might be using fairly large bits of sand hill and even possibly dragging this along the bottom. The size of a float reflects this as well, since off a man made structure, I'm likely to be using something a lot smaller. There's a bead above the float since this is a sliding setup and that is there to stop against the stop knot so it's easy to adjust the depth at which you're fishing. I thread the speed on first, then the float, then I place a rubber bead before the drilled bullet, another rubber bead after this. Next, I tie on a swivel using a uni knot. Trim off a tag end, then tie on the hook length. The hook length is about two foot long. The swivel helps prevent the hook length spinning up on the retrieve. Once again, a uni knot is used here, and then the tag end is cut off again. To finish off this setup, you need the stop knot. This is tied above the first bead that was placed onto the reel line. You don't want the line to be too thick, otherwise it would be difficult going through the rings of your rod. So I'm just using the same line as I use for my hook lengths. I've set the float to a depth of about 6 foot and I've put half a sand hill on the hook. I've cast about 25 yards out, I've tightened up to the float and I've released the bail arm. <laughs> 
I'm flicking the rod up, not to twitch the bait, but to release some more line, as the tide is pulling the floats still from left to right. I noticed the float dip, so that didn't take long. I tighten up in anticipation of a strike. Float goes under, so I quickly wind in some of the slack and then strike. So, first cast, and I'm into a fish straight away. Pretty pleased with that. Garfish takes a liking to my sand hill. Next cast, and I'm in again. Another gar of similar size to the first. When there's plenty about, it's easy to get carried away with fishing for these. That's not really what I've come here for, so I mustn't neglect the lead rods. But, since there's nothing happening on the lead rods yet, it'd be silly to ignore the sport that can be had on the float. I'm in again, and this starts a spell when I catch seven in seven casts. This one's a bit deeper hooked, so it needs to be disgorged. <laughs> 
left my float out whilst riding in my lead rod. Yeah, I still get a bite on that. And another fish on. The current on the inside is now running from right to left. This is better for me now, since that means that the float is not running underneath my lead rod line. Most of the fish are hooked in the scissors of the jaw, so it's easy to get a hook out. And I get my first bite on the bream rig. It feels a good fish, but unfortunately I also feel it come off. The rig comes back, minus the lead weight, which has been cut off. That fish obviously found a snag to run into. I put a new rig on, recast, and I get a bite on the drop. Well, it's not a bream, but I'll have to settle for a mackerel taking the bait. Or rather, it probably went for the shiny holographic sequin. When fishing for garfish, I prefer to use the head end of a sand hill as bait. However, chunks from the middle part of the sand hill are just as good, and also the tail end, even leaving the tail on. Here, I've put on a chunk from the middle, which is about 2 centimetres long. Still fishing a few feet off the bottom, so I've had to adjust the float set up accordingly since the tide is now ebbing. A couple of knocks on the lead rods mean I'm having to leave the float rod alone for a bit. <laughs> 
things go quiet again, so it's back onto the float. Here I've mounted the tail end of a sand hill. I should have mentioned that this float needed two drilled bullets rather than one to cock it properly. If I only had one, then the black band would be above water. That's useful in some situations when the light conditions make it difficult to see a coloured top. But that's not the case today, so the float is dotted right down. I'm still getting a bite almost every cast on the float. Then, just after returning that gar, I'll get a proper bite on the lead rod. It took its time coming, but at long last I'll get a half decent bream. Weather turns nasty now with a couple of heavy showers, so I just concentrate on the bream fishing. Another little tap gets my hopes up. Alas, not a bream, but a pouting. So, no more bream for me today. Still, I can't complain. It's been a terrific session with 11 garfish. And I'm quite sure I could have had 30 or so if I just fished for them all session. <laughs>